when the king, that is David, had settled into his palace, the Lord had given him rest on every side from all his enemies. The king said to Nathan the prophet, Look, I'm living in a cedar house, while the ark of God sits inside the tent of curtains. So Nathan told the king, Don't do it at all, it's on your heart, the Lord is with you. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go to my servant David and say, This is what the Lord says. You have built a house for me to live. From the time I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until today, I've not lived in a house. Instead, I've been moving around with the tabernacle tent. In all my journeys with all the Israelites, have I ever asked anyone among the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to serve my people of Israel, why haven't you built me a house of sin? Now, this is what you're going to say to my servant David. This is what the Lord of hosts says. I took you, David, from the pasture and from following the sheep to be ruled over my people of Israel. I've been with you wherever you've gone. And I've destroyed all your enemies before you. I will make a name for you like that of the greatest in the land. I will establish a place for my people of Israel and plant them so they may live there and not be disturbed again. Evildoers will not afflict them as they have done. Ever since the day I ordered judges to be over my people of Israel, I will give you rest from all the enemies. The Lord declares to you, the Lord himself will make a house for you. When your time comes and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up after you your descendant who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father of him, and he will be a son to me. When he does wrong, I will discipline him with the human rod and the blood of his mother's. But my faithful love will never leave him, as I removed him from Saul. I removed him from your womb. Your house and kingdom will endure before me forever, and your throne will be established forever. Nathan spoke all these words in this entire religion. Of the of course, we look to your word today. I pray that you would keep us mindful that you're a great promise keeper. And this promise, Lord, that you gave to David is fulfilled through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And if there be any here today who have yet to trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray this day, those individuals, that is a but resolve in the heart to trust you. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I enjoy, of course, Thanksgiving, all the kids being in. And by the way, Whitney and I, we ate our hot dog. We actually, as a family tradition, every Thanksgiving, we go to the Texas Inn in Lynchburg. I see Greg back there. He's been working in Lynchburg for quite a while. He knows what I'm saying. And uh, that's a tradition. Because my dad loved the Texas Inn. They had my mom and dad, they had a picture of the Texas Inn in their uh, den in their, in their living room there, uh, actually. But uh, I've told the story about my dad right after he had open heart surgery in 1986. I was with him and we went to the Texas Inn in downtown Lynchburg. The doctor told him at that time you could eat one hot dog a month. And it was the 30th day of the month. Ordered two hot dogs, and I'm sitting beside him. I said, Dad, what in the world is he doing? The doctor said, You don't need one. He said, I'm declaring a jubilee. I got through my surgery. <laughs> Three days later was the second day of the next month. We go back into Texas, and he gets two more hot dogs. I said, Dad, what are you doing? He said, It's a new month. <laughs> but that's sort of a tradition that, that we have. This past Wednesday afternoon, uh, Whitney had come in on Tuesday. I had planned this with Whitney. Um, she and I visited a historical marker that's located on Highway 60, not far from where uh, Charlie and Barry and Falda live. And we visited that marker because it honors my eighth great grandfather and her ninth great grandfather, <coughs> Colonel Robert Bowling. Uh, Colonel Robert Bowling was born on August 17th. 1738, the same day of the year Whitney was born, not the same year. <laughs> and he died in 1775. Uh, he died at the age of 37. But he was an accomplished person of 
great poem that served in the House of Burgesses and accomplished a lot of things. I think someone said it was actually the first sheriff of Buckingham County. He's part of our family line that goes all the way back to Pocahontas. Pocahontas is my 13th great grandmother. If you don't believe it, I'll show you the documentation. Got Whitney has that. She kept it. And I've got to write that book. I'll walk you through all the generations that you probably get bored with. But Whitney and I, as we went through, we began to study the genealogy. She realized this you know, very famous person in our uh, family was right here in Buckingham County. So I said, we got to take a picture by that historical marker. We wanted to look back to greatness. Today in our text, God is pointing David forward. I can look back 14 generations to my great, 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 I mean, yeah, you want to say grandmother Pocahontas, and I can look back to greatness, but twice that number, 28 generations after David, there was the greatest woman who ever lived on the face of the earth, Jesus Christ. After Jesus was on this earth, Paul said of the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, this is trustworthy and deserving a full acceptance. Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I'm most. Paul said that. You know, there are a number of covenants in the Bible. Probably the, there are two that are most familiar. There's the Abrahamic covenant that's given in Genesis chapter 15. That was the promise that he gave to Abraham that, that he would have descendants in his family line would be more than the stars in the sky. And that's one of the famous covenants. The second one is that which we find here in 2 Samuel chapter 7, the Davidic covenant, where God promises David that he would never fail to have a ruler from his lineage, that his rule would be eternal. Both the covenant to Abraham and the covenant that was given to David were in perpetuity. In other words, they go on and on and on. You know, there's so many things that cycle through in our lives, aren't there? There are things that we have that we really like, and they break down. But this covenant that we see that God has given David here it will be an eternal covenant. God says to David in verse 16 of our text today, Your house and kingdom will endure before me forever, and your throne will be established forever. Now that's a big promise that will only be fulfilled and is only fulfilled supernaturally by God's hand. Jesus is that fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. The child who came to this earth in Bethlehem is coming again to visibly rule and to rule forever. I want to look at this text just for a few moments this morning in its context. And we're going to see David's desire within God's declaration. The first thing I want to note in the first about seven verses of this text is David's desire. Again, we're going to look at it in the context of what is happening here. Well, David's king, and, and David was the second king of, of, of Israel. Saul was king before him. Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin, but God was not happy with Saul. Saul was not a man of faith. And so God determined that he was going to break that line of Saul from the line of Benjamin, and he was going to start again with a guy who was after his own heart. That was David. David would be the least expected ruler, even of the sons of Jesse. But that's how God works many times in unexpected ways. And so we see that David is the king, and he's sitting in his home. And, and David looks around, and he's upset. Because God didn't have a house. David said, I have a house to live in, but God doesn't. And so David had a plan, but God had a better plan. You know, at this time of year, there are so many worthy ministries. We'll go this week and outside of Walmart, we'll hear people ringing the bell, volunteering. That's a good cause. I think about the cause of the Salvation Army. Every Christmas, we expect that ministry. There's the Lion Moon Christmas offering, which for us is definitely essential. 
100% of the monies that are given to buy them Christmas off and go toward the foreign mission field. And so that's a great cause. The angel tree ministry, the Christmas mother ministry, the SBCD Christmas backpacks in the Appalachian area. We've had Operation Christmas Child. I appreciate Trudy's work with that. I think right at 200 boxes are coming. There are food pantries, and there are times when people need fuel assistance, and assistance especially during this time of year. And you know, as you think of it, every one of these ministries is worthwhile. Every one of them is a good cause. Sometimes it's difficult for us to support all of them, but there may be two or three who are dear to our heart. We see that David here in 2 Samuel chapter 7 had a worthy cause that he was going to take up. He wanted to build God a temple. Notice what he said to Nathan, his friend, in verse 2. I'm living in a cedar house while the ark of God, now the ark of God represented the presence of God. We know God can't be, when Solomon built the temple, he said, God can't be contained in the building. We know that God is greater. But the ark of the covenant represented the presence of God. So you might translate it this way. Uh, here I am living in a cedar house while the presence of God sits inside the tent curtains. Now remember we said David was settled in the holy city and he was the king. The tabernacle, if you remember Old Testament history, was in the time when Israel was not settled, when they were a transient people, when they were on the move, before the holy city was established and before uh, they overcame uh, the peoples who were in the land established Jerusalem as a city. And so what would happen is uh, the tabernacle representing the presence of God with the ark of the covenant in it, as the people would move, the tabernacle would move. But let's put it better this way. As the tabernacle would move, then the people would move. And so we see that it happened. But now, David is settled. There's no conflict really around him. There had been a lot. And so he began to think. And he thought, why am I in this nice house and God is in a large and not fancy tent? It bothered David that he was living better than we thought God was living. And David had a right perspective here. God deserved more. And God deserves more from us. He deserves more love. He deserves more devotion. He deserves more time. God deserves more service from us. And he certainly deserves more glory. You see, really, that David was concerned, he felt like the glory of his abode was greater than the glory of God's abode, and it bothered him, and that was good that it bothered him. You know, a great goal for you this Christmas season is that in us God would have more. That we would think of him. And so we see David shared this desire with Nathan. And Nathan said immediately, basically in verse two, 3, he says, go do it. Now Nathan was a good man. He was a godly man. We'll see about, uh, I guess it's five chapters after this that Nathan had to confront David when David did something. And he didn't shy away from it. And so Nathan was bold. He was a godly guy. He was a true friend. He didn't tell David what David wanted to hear often. He told him what he needed to hear. But right here, Nathan was impulsive. Have you ever been that way? I've been that way. I've acted too quickly. He did not check with God before he told David, go ahead and do it. And the point that we get as we look at Nathan, because God had to correct me, is that we need to hear from God. You try to hear from God every day. God been with God in a relationship for 40 years in my life, except for you. I have never heard of all the voice of God. I have, like I hear with my physical ears, never in my life. But I've heard it. I heard him this morning as I was reading his word. Exactly 
way he spoke in my spirit. And so we need to hear from God. I'm reading a book called Two Chairs. It's so basic. You say, Rick, why are you reading that book? You've been a pastor. You've studied. I mean, it's a simple book. And basically what it says is we need to be with God. Something we so easily know, but so infrequently practice. And what he said, how he did, and this was a physical reminder, not that God would be there, but he'd set a chair in a room, a quiet room, and he would talk with God. That's how he interacts with God. And I think one time uh, somebody said, well, I can lie on my bed and talk to God. And he said, well, what is Warren Buffett would have come and give you financial advice today. Would you just lie in your bed in your pajamas or would you get up and sit in the chair and look him face to face? And the point was, we need to hear from God. You know, that ought to be our desire of this holy season. In the midst of all the hustle and bustle, all of the activities that would distract us, that we would take time to hear from God. See, Nathan here, he focused on a good thing. But he wasn't doing what God would have him do in the instruction that he gave to David. And so it says in verse 4, But that night the word of the Lord came, and they could go to my servant David and say, and then he goes through about three to four verses. Uh, this really isn't my plan. I, I, I brought these people out from Egypt in, in all of these years. Have you ever heard me ask why has someone not built me. Now again, I'm not criticizing David because you see his desire was good. But he needed to give the perfect gift. If you ever struggle with Christmas giving the perfect gift, I've done that. And sometimes the older people are the most difficult people to give. I remember my great aunt, she had about everything. And uh, I always wanted to impress my great aunt because she was a surrogate grandmother to me. Spent a lot of time on uh, Alice. And uh, but every year it was uh, lotion, hand lotion. I mean, that's what she wanted. I could give her a gold bracelet and she probably would set it aside. But if I gave her hand lotion, she would be thrilled. And I'm thinking, how does anybody like hand lotion? <laughs> See, David wanted to do something. But God said, Hey, that's great, but that's not really what I need. Later, it's not on the list now, but later, yes. And so we see David's desire. So what do we get from that? It's good to think about God. David was thinking about God. We need to think about God. It's good to, to desire God's glory rather than our own. It's good when we're looking at ourselves and the things we have to realize that God is greater than we are and deserves more. But we also learn from Nathan, especially here, that we need to hear from God. If we're going to do what God, what pleases God, we need to first know what He wants. And that leads us to God's declaration in verse 8 through 16. Basically, what God is doing is He's saying, Nathan, you, you didn't get it right. He doesn't need to build me a house. That's not really what I want now. And he began to speak from verse 8 to verse 16 directly to Nathan. Nathan was going to be a messenger who was going to give everything God said in the word to David. Now David was focused on a building. God was focused on a kingdom. Follow this. David was focused on what he could do for God. God was focused on what God was going to do through David. You see the difference? David's off on his own, not really hearing from Nathan right. And I've got this plan. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this for God. And God says, I don't want you to do for me. I want to do through you. I want you to know what I am going to do in and through your life. That's it. Good to want to serve God? Yes, it is. But I think you understand the difference between going for God on our own and allowing God to work through us. We need to want God to work through us, not just for Him. We want to be doing what He's called us to do, and we want to see His work in and through us. And God gives a message to 
8 and through 8 if you in verses 8 through 16. And we've been looking at the messianic promises here. We've been looking at the coming of Jesus. And we have here a messianic promise that one would come from David's life who would rule forever. Now I've got that documentation there. And if you start with Pocahontas and you come down, it may go in some various trees, but you're going to see William Roger Caldwell about that 14th generation. There's going to be some of her blood that's going to come through me. I'm part of that line that comes through. And so we see here a messianic promise that there would be one of David's line, and it says in verse 13, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now it's very important, and, and I studied it during this week. As we interpret what he's telling Nathan here, we need to understand that interpreting it requires a little bit <coughs> because there's an immediate fulfillment in these verses that will be accomplished through Solomon, but there's a greater fulfillment that will come through Jesus. Follow what it, it says, verse 13. He will build a house for my name. Who was that? That would be Solomon. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. How is that fulfilled? Through his seed, David. Notice what it says in verse 14. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me when he does wrong. How do we know that Solomon? Jesus didn't do wrong. Jesus was sinless. When he does wrong, I will discipline him with a human rod and with blows from others. Solomon did a lot of he chased after a lot of foreign women. But notice what he says. God says in verse 15, But my faithful love will never leave him as I removed it from Saul. Saul didn't have a heart to follow God, didn't have faith, and God broke from his line and started with David. But even though Solomon was a sinful man, God still said, I will not remove my faithful love. And so Jesus comes to the line of Solomon. Look very quickly in Matthew chapter 1. If you read the Christmas story, you usually don't go through this if you like I do. There is a long genealogy. I was talking to Paul Singer a little bit earlier, a little laughing. He was a lay speaker here probably about 30, 35 years ago that preached on the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It went through the 42 generations. Such such the God, such such the God, such and such. He said it was probably one of the longest messages we ever heard. We're not going to do that today. There's some things we want to say. Notice what it says. First, in Matthew 1. Remember there were two covenants. We talked about the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant. Look at Matthew 1. The historical record of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Then go down to verse 6. Jesse followed King David. Then David fathered Solomon by Uriah's wife. All right? Solomon fathered Rehoboam. Now go all the way down to verse 16. And Jacob fathered Joseph, the mother, the husband of Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, his father and son. So what we see here, the line of David through Solomon to Jesus. There's a promise. Now look again, very quickly. At Romans chapter 1, while we're in the New Testament. Let's see what Paul had to say about it. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. We just looked at Matthew 1, now we're looking at Romans 1, in verse 1. It says, Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, called out as an apostle, singled out for God's good news, which he promised long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was a descendant of David. Notice the promise was given to David. And so we see that here in the New Testament, Jesus is that descendant of David, according to the flesh, and establishes the powerful Son of God by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness. And so we see that through Solomon, the line of David came. And Jesus was and is that descendant, that earthly descendant of David. We fulfill that promise. Now let's go back. David wanted to build a temple for the Lord. 
Let's go through a little bit of the history of the temple because the first part of our text, David says, I want to build a house. Well, the temple would be built in Solomon's day. That, that was the promise. But it was destroyed about 400 years later by the Babylonians. It was rebuilt probably around 520 BC, give a little death in the days of Jerusalem. But the people who saw the second building of the temple wept, not with happiness, they wept over grief because they realized even the glory of the first temple was far greater than the simplicity of this temple. Well, that temple that was less impressive was defiled by Antiochus Epiphanes in the 160s BC. It was renovated by Herod, it became known as Herod's temple. But in AD 70, it was destroyed by the Romans. So the temple made by man, even though it was well intended to think about it, was destroyed twice and, and it became less glorious of the temple. They wept when they saw the second. Now I'm not criticizing the building of the temple. What I'm trying to say is David's heart at the beginning of this chapter, I want to do something for you, God. And, and it was good that he wanted to do something. But it was something that was going to decline over time. It was a, a human enterprise. In contrast, God said, what you do for me won't last, but what I do through you will be eternal. What God does when he puts it on our heart and works through us, that is what is significant. Jesus came to this earth humble. We saw two weeks ago, he came in Bethlehem in a small way. He was born in a manger among the animals. He was born, and remember, they came to the religious leaders who were just a few miles away, and they were saying, where is he? And they had no idea. They had studied the scripture, and they didn't know he was right beneath their nose. In that very region, no one knew. Like that tiny mustard seed. His kingdom increases. There's one thing about Christmas <coughs> the prophecy, the prophecy about Christ is it's really twofold. It's first time and the second time. You ever you travel out west, you go to Lynchburg or farther. It's beautiful this time of year. But you go out west and you look, you'll see the Blue Ridge Mountains and you'll see the sun. And, and the Blue Ridge Mountains will seem bigger than the sun. What's the big the sun? But the Blue Ridge Mountains are closer. And sometimes you'll see you can't differentiate the two. And really, as, as the prophets looked at the two comings of Christ, the first coming of Christ, which we're preparing to celebrate just next month in Bethlehem, and the second coming, which is still in our future, they saw both. If we look at them in the 2,000 years of several, they, they look at them like we would look at the Western horizon, not even. Always distinguish. I want to look at two Old Testament prophecies before I close with the challenge today. Daniel chapter 2. And you may remember the king Nebuchadnezzar had vision of a statue of a dream. He didn't know what it meant. Nobody could interpret it except Daniel. The head of that statue was gold. And Daniel interpreted for him that head represents you. You're the greatest king of this earth. Uh, human is speaking at the time. But then the, the, the chest part, this part, uh, was a silver. He said, that's going to be a kingdom that will come after you, the Neo Persian kingdom. And then there was the, the sum of the midsection area and all. There was bronze. And that would represent the Greek Empire of Alexander the Great. And then there would be the legs of that statue, which were symbolized as iron. And and clay would be hard to get through. And it speaks of all of the kingdoms of the earth as they go through time. And every one of them would be replaced by another. And then he says this, the king saw a stone cut out not with human hands but struck that statue and dropped and crumbled all the kingdoms of the earth. And the rock stood. That rock but out not with human hands, it was Jesus Christ. And it says, in those days, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom.
that will never be destroyed. We see here, he says, David, from your line is going to come a kingdom that will never be destroyed. It's fulfilled when Jesus comes back. Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 4. You can read it as you go home. But part of that speaks of the mountain of the Lord's house will be established at the top of the mountain. And all the nations will stream to it. Usually think of a stream going down. It says in that name, the stream will go up. People will be drawn to the King of Kings. Finally, I want you to look at Zechariah. We were in Matthew. If you go backward from Matthew, the last book of the Old Testament is Malachi. And right before Malachi is Zechariah. So it's just two books in front of Matthew. Just two books in front of Matthew. I love this. We did a study, I guess a year or two ago on Sunday nights out of Zechariah. It's one of my favorite studies. But in Zechariah chapter 8, verses 22 and 23, I just want to read these two verses. Many people and strong nations will come. When is that? At the Lord's coming. To seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to plead for the Lord's favor. The Lord of hosts says this. I love it. In those days, ten men from nations of every language will grab the robe of a Jewish man and fight him, urging, Let us go with you. We heard that God is with you. That's powerful. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's come the first time in Bethlehem. But it's coming again. David's desire, it was good to build a temple, but the earthly temple that was built did not last. The glory of the second paled in comparison to the first, and even that was destroyed. But David's life will never be destroyed. Jesus' kingdom will increase. Jesus said of his own body, destroy this temple this sanctuary and in three days God will raise it up. What I love of that picture out of Zechariah 8 is somebody saying you're going where I want to go. You're going to Jesus and I want to go. And so they may not have known the way you picture you can't see or whatever when you do you're holding on to the person that knows the way. I wonder today what are you holding? Are you holding to a dream that's going to fade? Are you holding to your own strength that you're going to be okay or are you holding to the Lord Jesus Christ? We see the promise here. He's the one whose kingdom will last for us. There's coming a day when every single one of us will have to answer to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to say, basically, what have you clung to me? Have you clung to me in faith? Have you clung to me? The things that you want to do, your aspirations, your ideology. You see, the Bible says that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. We're sinners. If we don't sin in what we say, we sin in what we do. If we don't sin in what we say or do, we sin in what we think. If we don't sin by doing the wrong thing, we'll sin by not doing the right thing that we ought to do. We're sinners. And the Bible says that wages of sin is death. And we know that there's physical death. We've all experienced death in our loved ones and family. But the book of Revelation speaks of the worst death, the second death, which is eternal separation from God in a place called hell, where there's torment, where there's agony. The Bible speaks of that, that we are that we're sinners in the ways of that sin, the blessing is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Our Lord. We're looking at a movie this week. I don't look at a lot of movies. But in this particular movie, I can't even remember the title of it, but it was, had to do with being silent. And it was sort of a thriller and it scared me. It was this family. And this daughter always wondered if the dad loved her. And there was noise that drew these creatures to attack her. 
the kids and the fathers of this is from the child. We looked at the little girl because the little girl had made a mistake that had her little brother passing and she wondered if her dad loved her. And as we looked out back almost to like the back of the church, he said, I love you. She said, I love you back. And then he did something. He screamed to the top of his lungs to draw all the attention to him to himself. Now, his own daughter. I thought about that. Jesus died for us while we were his enemies. We might say it's virtuous for a dad to scream to take on death upon himself instead of his child. But think about somebody who's your enemy. Jesus Christ died for you while you were a sinner. And what he wants you to do is to be sin. Wouldn't you trust him? He took upon himself your sin. But notice what it says in Romans 1, 1, 3, 4. He died because he will not perish. He cannot perish. His body could not stay in his hand because he is the promised Messiah giving victory over sin and death. Today, if you've never done so, I need to say, Jesus Christ, I'm a sinner. I want to put you at the center of my life. I want to put you in the face. I know that you died for me. I know that the only way I'll ever live forever is by trusting in your faith, your sacrifice for me. I know you died in my place. You died to take the wrath of sin upon yourself away from me. And I trust you. Wouldn't you have said Jesus Christ? You see, God's will. All his places. We thank you that you so love the world that you gave your only son. And whosoever believed in you could not perish for the last of life. For the grave could not keep Jesus there. Lord, you knew it when you made that promise to David that Jesus is the fulfillment of that. And that Lord. Just like those Gentiles in that coming day who are clinging to the robe of those who are coming to you, Lord, we need to come to you and cling to you. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, who is God and who loves us more than a father would love a child. And you're worthy, Lord, of our lives. You're worthy of more, Lord, as David saw. Lord, if there be any here today who need to step forward and follow you in faith, with your hearts and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm. Our hymn is a good place for this. What's the number today? Number 275.